he saw our work. And we see how worthy he is. Amen. I want us now to turn, if you would be so kind, to our selected passage found in Psalm 119. Of course, our focus today is on verses 73. Amen. Through verse 80. 73 through 80. If you don't have a Bible, of course, Bibles are in your pews. You can grab one of those. And it is also printed in the bulletin. Amen. Today, I'll be preaching from and using the New International Version. Well, of course, you used to be using the New King James Version. Today, I would like to use the New International Version as we uh, preach through this series. Of course, we're continuing in our weekly sermonic series entitled Reset as we focus on 176 verses of uh, Psalm 119. Uh, this week we are um, in Psalm 10. Amen. In Psalm 10. And you should be there by now. Amen. So if you would be so kind to stand up on your feet as we reference the word of God in both my reading and in your hearing. As we look at Psalm 119, in particular, uh, this cluster, this 10th cluster, beginning at verse 73, here's how the word of God reads. Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause, but I will meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I may not be put to shame. As we continue in this series entitled Reset, I want to use as a topic and a title for this particular installment, this phrase, let the Lord use you. Amen. Amen. As you take your seat, you ought to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, let the Lord use you. Let the Lord use you. Let the Lord use you. Amen. Amen. I think that sometimes, friends, we don't understand or realize the magnitude or the awesome uh, uh, things that God can do and wants to do to us and through us. I don't think we understand the magnitude of uh, uh, the level of which God wants to use us, his instruments. We are his mouthpieces. We're his hands, we're his feet, we're his ambassadors. And because we are his ambassadors, and because we are his instruments, we are uh, therefore created and or placed and put in positions where we can have great impact and make great impacts all around this world. You never know the difference that you make in the life of another person just by interacting with them. I tell you this all the time and I'll continue to tell you this all the time. We make a difference. And when we really surrender ourselves and surrender our lives to God, and allow him to use us in such a way, you never know your kindness towards someone else may help to pull them up from utter despair and utter dismay. You never know who may be on the brink of just throwing in the towel, who may be at rock bottom in their life and may feel like giving up, may feel like uh, taking matters into their own hands. And just by someone coming along and seeing their worth, and seeing their value, and by allowing God to speak to them and speak through them, may speak life into someone else and may keep that person and prevent that person from doing something that is devastating and damaging to themselves or to someone else. I've stopped by all the way to heaven to tell somebody, let the Lord use you. Because you never know whose path you may cross. And in past and crossing their path, if you allow God to use you and to speak with your mouth, if you allow God to use you and use your gifts and use your body and work 
on your heart and work through you as an instrument, you never know the difference you can make in someone's life. I tell people all the time, say kind words to people because you never know. The kind word that you say, the kind word that you share may be the only kind word they receive all day. For some people, it may be the only kind word they receive all week. Some people go home and they're berated. Some people go home and they're belittled. Some people go home and they get nothing but negativity. No one says anything positive to them. They always point out the wrong. They always point out where they're failing. They always point out their inadequacies. They always point out, you know, areas that they can improve upon. But very little do you, you, you sometimes in those situations do you go where someone says, you look nice today. Someone says, you did a really good job at this or doing that. Some, or where someone says, I value you. I value your presence. I value your contribution. Sometimes uh, some folk are, are, are so beaten up at home and around the folk that so-called love them that sometimes they question themselves. Sometimes they doubt themselves. Sometimes they feel as though they, they, they aren't worth anything. I mean, if someone hears something often enough on a regular basis, they're inclined to believe it, whether it's good or bad. So if someone hears all day long, every day, you're a dummy, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're fat, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too this, you're this and that. If someone hears that enough, before long, they may start wondering, well, am I what they say that I am? Yeah. My brothers and my sisters, I repeat once again, we ought to be mindful of how we as instruments and ambassadors of God can make an indelible impression upon the lives of other people and in particular in this world. So again, I say to you, let the Lord use you. Let the Lord use your tongue. Let the Lord use your mouth. Let the Lord use your gifts so that you can have a greater and a more positive impact upon the people to which you encounter and come in contact with. Senior folks used to say it best, if you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. If we learn to practice that and live by that, oh, this world will be such a better place. If you ain't got nothing positive to say to your brother, then guess what? Zip your lip. If you ain't got nothing good and godly and edifying, because as the word tells us, we ought to edify one another. We ought to build one another up, not tear one another down. And we spend too much time tearing one another down. This world is filled with folk who can't see and don't see the positive in one another. And so we spend time tearing one another down and hating on one another. Listen, I've learned a long time ago, ain't no sense in hating on my neighbor. If I see God blessing my neighbor, I want to celebrate. I want to play a hate. Yes, sir. Because when you can celebrate what God is doing with your neighbor, not only are you showing how mature you are, but hopefully you can see that if God is blessing your neighbor, that means he's in the neighborhood. Yeah. And if he's in the neighborhood, guess what? He's going to stop by my house sooner or later. God's not a respectful person. What he's done for others, he can do the same thing for you. So let us learn to be more positive. Let us learn to be more encouraging to one another. And I'm so glad to see that this, that this psalmist is not only an individual who uh, realizes the power of God's word, but he also realizes the power in his positive speech and or positive proclamation. I, I, I see this psalmist and in this psalmist, psalmist and through the psalmist, a person who learned to, uh, to, to love God in such a way that it's not only vertical, but it's also horizontal. And coincidentally, and there's no such thing as coincidence, all things are um, providence, amen, by um, the providential handiwork of God. But isn't it interesting as you look at the cross that... You have a vertical beam and you have a horizontal beam. You have a cross beam. And so I, I, I want to suggest to you that it's indicative of what our spirituality ought to look like. Our spirituality ought to be vertical, where we and God commune and where we and God have a healthy relationship. But that is incomplete if we don't have a horizontal relationship one with another. The word says, how can you say that you love God who you have never seen, but you don't love your brother and your sister who you see every day? Yeah. Something's 
wrong with your religion. Something's wrong with your faith. If you can only love God but not love God's people and Come God's on. creation. Great. If you can only love God but not love those who were made in the image and likeness of God. If you can only love God but you can't extend love to those that he died for. His bride. If you can't show love to your brother and your sister, then something's wrong with your love. My brothers yeah. and my sisters, if the, the, the cross is incomplete without vertical and horizontal. Our love goes up and down as well as the cross. And we ought to show love and share love to one another. And the psalmist is an individual that does not have a problem with saying something about who God is and what God has done for him and what God has done to him. And it's interesting, my brothers and my sisters, that... When we look at the word of God and, 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 and the value that he places on the word of God, if we as children of the most high God don't do the same thing, then we're missing something. Because there's power in the word. Yes, there is. There is healing in the word. Amen. There is strength in the word. Yes, there's encouragement in the word. There's hope and there's help in the word. Everything you need is in the word. And this psalmist understands that. But what I also discovered about this and the word, bless you, and what the psalmist was able to understand, watch this, is that the word of God doesn't need any verification or validation. Did y'all hear what I just said? The word of God doesn't need verification and validation. It stands alone on its own. It's an independent uh, proclamation and writing. That, that doesn't need anyone to come and say, oh, okay, yes, this is valid. Or yes, we verify this. Whether man verifies it, whether man validates it, whether extra um, uh, books um, outside of the Bible support it or not, it's the word of God. Amen. So it doesn't need your stamp of approval. Come on. It doesn't need your, your, your seal of authenticity. Come on. The word of God is just that. It is the word of God. Yes. And it stands on its own. That's right. However, my brothers and my sisters, we, we as believers, um, I think sometimes miss that. I think sometimes we, we ignore or we overlook how powerful and how potent and how pertinent the word of God is. It's powerful. It's like a two-edged sword. It cuts going in and coming out. It's, 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 it's potent. Everything that, that we need to make it in life and to sustain ourselves in life and to survive in life is right here in the Word. It's potent. Yes, sir. It can break and uh, destroy shackles in our lives. It can, it can liberate our minds. It can save our souls. Yes. we got to learn the Word of God. That's yes. it. It's potent. Mm -hmm. It's pertinent. Oh, it's, it, listen. It's most relevant then, mm -hmm. now, yes. yeah. and in time to come. Hallelujah. Yeah. First of all, God is the, is the God, the same God. He's the same God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. God never changes. And so if God is relevant then, now, and forevermore, then obviously so is his word. And I, I have to make that point because there's some people who are of the persuasion and who are convinced that uh, the word of God is antiquated and out of date. It is, it is not relevant. It's not germane to today's time. So they'll say, oh, yeah, that was, that was good for in times of antiquity. Yes, but, 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 it, but it's antiquated now. Times have changed, and, 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 and we have evolved. So the word of God um, is not relevant for today's times. Oh, my brother and my sisters, you couldn't be any further from the truth if you have Amen. ascribed to that particular way of thinking and that philosophy. The word of God is most relevant and pertinent to our everyday uh, encounters. The word of God is transcendent. That means it is not bound by time from the beginning all the way until the end of this world as we know it. The word of God is relevant. Amen. It's relevant for your situation. It's relevant for your predicament. Whatever you're dealing with in life, whatever you face in life, it is relevant. Hallelujah. And you've got to see that, that, that relevancy, and how pertinent it is, how powerful it is. Amen. Yeah. Um, and its potency. So, it's a couple things that the Word of God and our understanding of the Word of God, a couple things that it does for us and what it should do to us. Um, 
it, 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 it ought to remind us of who God is. It ought to remind us of what God can do. Amen. And when it reminds of us of who God is and what God can do, then we ought to be encouraged to be able to go through life and be able to handle whatever life presents to us. Mm -hmm. That's why as a mature believer, you can say, I ain't never scared. <laughs> I ain't never afraid. That's why you as a mature believer yes. can say, I may not like what I'm going through, but I can live with what I'm going through. Yes, That's why you as a believer can say, I am more than a conqueror Amen. through Christ Jesus. Yes. You can yes. say these things because unequivocally, you, uh, you see yourself as, as, as one who is greater than what it is that you're going through and what it is that you're dealing with and the one who has thrown it at you. That's Ooh. why the word of God says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Sure. You've got so much power inside of you, but I don't know that we always understand and realize that. Yeah. You was a bad brother Come on. Yeah. and a bad sister. Come on. You got it going on. Come why? On, because you got God on the inside. Hallelujah. And if God is for you, who can be against you? If God is on your side, then you and your right mind will stand up against you. I'm telling you, my brothers and my sisters, yes. we sometimes belittle and or we overlook how powerful the word of God is in our lives. And so we have been afforded the privilege to speak up and to speak out. Amen. Amen. We, we have been given the privilege to say something on behalf of the Most High God. Now, once again, the Word of God stands alone. It stands on its own. It doesn't need our verification and our validation. But because of what God has done to us and for us, and because we as believers understand the power of the Word of God, we ought to say something. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say something. There's a whole lot of folks that's got opinions and got something to say in life and in this world. But if there's anyone who has something to say, it ought to be those who have been redeemed. It ought to be those who have been born again. It ought to be those who have been blood washed. It ought to be those who consider themselves to be children of the Most High God because of the faith and the trust and the hope that they've placed in He and He alone. So if He's done that for you, you ought to say so. We ought not walk around and live our lives tight-lipped. We all not walk around and live our lives whereby we don't open up and testify on his behalf. Yeah. To, I want to suggest to you, to sit silently is a sin. Mm. After all God has done for you, mm. and who God is to you, mm. and you dare have the nerve to sit there and not say something on his behalf, mm. that's, that's atrocious. Somebody ought to say so. <laughs> and in particular, it ought to be the redeemed. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. So watch, watch this. This is, what, this is what the word of God does for us. Number one, it gives us an opportunity to say something. It gives us an opportunity. Watch this in verse 74. It says, may those who fear you rejoice when they see me. Let's stop right there. What the psalmist is saying is when those uh, individuals in this world, when they see me, uh, I want those individuals to rejoice. Those who fear you, when they see me, a, uh, uh, a product of you, one who was created in your image and in your likeness, when they see me, prayerfully they will see you. Yeah. And when they see you, when, uh, by looking at me, uh, those who fear you, he says, I pray that they rejoice and or that they will have a better picture, a better understanding of who you are. Okay, y'all look at me like I'm, I'm, I'm saying this in a different language. So let me break it down for you. Watch this. I want to suggest to you that what the psalmist, what the psalmist is saying, uh, he is highlighting the fact that the word of God creates an opportunity for us to speak up and to speak out. Mm -hmm. And in creating that opportunity, my brothers and my sisters, we, uh, we are used as a vehicle mm -hmm. 
to bring God to others, Amen. and in particular, those that may not know him. Right. Right. Okay, right. stood not here. Let me see if I can give it to you this way. The Bible says that we ought to let the light inside of us shine so bright huh. that others might see the hope that is inside of us. Right. Yeah. We used to sing that song as children coming up. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine everywhere I go. I'm going to let it shine in my home. I'm going to let it shine. The light that is inside of you ought to shine so bright yes, sir. that wherever you go and whoever you come in contact with, they ought to see that light. They ought to see something inside of you. They ought to see the hope that is inside of you. They ought to see the Christ that is inside of you. And they ought to see it in so much yeah. that they want what is inside of you. They ought to be drawn closer to him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let me give it to you this way. The word of God says about Jesus, he says, if I be lifted up, if the son of man be lifted up, he says, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen. Come here, let me ask you a question. How good of a job are you doing at lifting him up? Because when we lift him up, he says, I'll draw. And so when we talk about church growth, if I just throw this in here, we talk about church growth all around the country and how, you know, folk are leaving the church in droves and churches are dying and dwindling when it comes to membership and all of that. So, uh, you know, church leaders and, and folk are coming up with gimmicks and different ways of trying to draw people back into the church and win them back to the uh, to church and all that type of carrying on. And fine, do those things. Have special days. Have themes. Have um, friends and family. Invite your friends. All of that. Do all of that stuff. Even Events and concerts, fine, whatever, do all that. But I want to tell you right here, right now, the way that you really grow the church and the way that you really expand the kingdom is right here in this statement where he says, if I be lifted up, yes. I'll draw. So guess what, the, guess what our responsibility is? The onus is on us. To lift him up. Yes, sir. There ought to be authentic worship and authentic praise in the house of God. And when there's authentic praise and authentic worship, then uh, uh, as he's lifted up, he'll draw folk. Yes. Folk will be, could be sitting in their homes and, and ain't, ain't been no thinking about church. And all of a sudden, something quickens them and they say, I need to get to the church house. Something quickens them and they say, yes, I need to go and I need to be in fellowship with other believers. Something, they'll be driving up and down the street, ain't never draw up the street street before. I ain't never noticed this church before. And something will call unto them and say, I need to be in that church. Yeah. When we lift him up, yes, he sir. will draw. Yes, sir. Yes. Praise God. So I need to challenge us today, church. Yes, sir. We need to do uh, a, 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 uh, a better job of lifting him up. Mm -hmm. We ain't got to worry about gimmicks and, and schemes and trickery. Just lift up his name. And when we lift up his name, we do it with excellence. Whatever area it is you're called to serve in, do it with excellence. If you are on the door and you ought to meet and greet people as they come in, do it with excellence. And lift up his name. God will draw. If you are called to sing and be a part of the praise team, do it with excellence. And God will draw when you sing from your heart, not merely from your talent. When you sing with the anointing and not just out of your gifts. God will be lifted up, and he will draw when you play instruments, play it to the glory of God. He gave you the gifts in the first place to be able to play. Lift up his name. Make a commitment to be committed. If you're supposed to be here at a certain time, be here at a certain time. If you're supposed to do a certain thing, do that thing, and do it with everything you have. Give God your best. Worship him. We can lift him up and draw all men. So it affords us an opportunity to speak up and say something. So he says, may those who fear you rejoice when they see me. In other words, he's saying, use me, Lord. Yeah. It is us getting to a point in our life and in our relationship where we're saying, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Are y'all hearing me on today? Yeah. Let the Lord use you. Yeah. So number one, there's an opportunity for us uh, to, 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 to do uh, what he has called us to do and to speak out on his behalf. As we watch this, as we look to the word, as believers, individuals, as we look to the word, we learn from the word, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 
And as we learn from the word, we then therefore live the word before those who are in the world. Yeah. Stay with me now. And so as we live before those in the world, in turn, the world looks at us and also looks toward him. And hopefully and prayerfully, as they look at us and then look towards him or turn towards him, the ultimate goal is that they too would live for him. Yes. I need to give that to you again. I, I, I really do. Watch me now. Stay with me. As we look to the word. Yes. As we look to the word. Yes. As we learn from the word. Amen. We then ought to live the word yes. and live that word in such a way before the world that they in turn will look at us and look toward him yes. and then ultimately live for him. Yes. That's letting God Amen. use you. Yes. Okay, let me give it to you this way. For some people, you are the only Bible they'll ever read. Come on, now. Come on. And if you are the only Bible that they will ever read, what is it that they're reading? Yeah. Come on now. For some people, they'll never on their own crack open the Word of God. For whatever reason, they have chosen that I'm just not going to do it. And, and, and they'll never on their own open up a Bible and therefore read the Word of God. So for those people, guess what? The only word that they'll ever read when it comes to God's Word is your lifestyle. Mm, come on. You're the only word that some people will ever read. <laughs> so if you are the only word that they'll, they'll ever read, what is it? When they look at your life, what is it that they see? Do they, do, they, do, they, do they see God working in such a way that they want more of God? Or do they look at you and say, I don't want no parts of God? Yes. Come on now. What type of example do you set? Yeah. Yeah. What, what type of witness are you for the most high? Are you turning people on for the kingdom or turning people off? Yeah. Someone has rightfully suggested that there's one of two reasons why people don't go to church or give their lives to Christ. One is because they've never seen a Christian. The other is because they have. I'll let that sink in and you catch that on the way home. In some instances, it's because they, they've never seen a true Christian. In some instances, it's because they've seen so-called Christians and they said, if that's what the church is all about, I don't want no parts of it. Can't say amen, say ouch. Mm -hmm. So we have an opportunity to speak out what we have in the word. But watch this. We also have an option to do so. We are not forced to do anything for God. He did, he did not create robots. He did not create us to be puppets. We have an option when it comes to serving God and or speaking out on his behalf. You have a choice. And so when we are challenged and charged, Redeem to say so, though we have a choice, it really ought to be, um, you, you ought to feel privileged. You ought to want to. You ought to come running to say something on his behalf. I mean, after all, he did for you what you were not able to do for yourself. Well, he did for you what your money was not able to do. Your money may be able to bail you out in certain situations, but your money can't save your soul. Your money may be able to do a whole lot of things, but when it comes to your eternal destiny, your eternal destination, your money, you can't buy your way into heaven. You can have the wealth and the riches of a Bill Gates and or a uh, Warren Buffett or anyone else on the Forbes list. And no matter how much money you have, no matter how many riches and how many jewels and, and how much gold and all of that, no matter how much you have, it cannot buy you salvation. It cannot buy you eternal life. So when it's all said and done, because of what he did for you, what no one or nothing else could do, you ought to want to say something. But it is your choice. Trust and believe that he ain't forcing you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have an option to say something. Yeah. 
Now I notice in verse 76 through 30 and verse, verse 80, it's something interesting here. He says, may your unfailing love be. And verse 77 says, let your compassion come. And verse 78, he says, may the arrogant uh, be put to shame. And verse 79 says, may those who fear you turn to me. And in verse 80, he says, may I wholeheartedly follow you. It's interesting that in this prayer, it, it, it sounds like to me, what the psalmist is doing is he's praying that God would uh, make these things come to pass. Look, look, look. Verse 80 says, may I wholeheartedly follow your decrees. Does that sound like to you that he is saying, make this come to pass? Mm -hmm. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees. In verse 79, may those who fear you turn to me. It is, he is suggesting when he says, may I, uh, he is suggesting that this is something that he is asking God to do. Is that how you see that? Mm -hmm. Well, understand this. God is not going to make you do or make anyone do other than what, anything other than what they choose to do. We have an option. So really, as we look at this, you know, I'll, I'll never tell anyone how to pray. But let me ask you something. If in your prayer, you're asking God to do to you or do for you what he has already challenged and charged you to do, then how effective is your prayer? The onus is on you. God's not going to force his way upon you. It's on you. It's your responsibility. So when he says, may I wholeheartedly live? May I do this? May Listen, it's your choice. It's your option to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think sometimes we get into this whole notion of God being like some cosmic fairy godmother type of person or some um, cosmic genie where you rub on the lamp and you make your wish or he's going to sprinkle some um, fairy dust on top of you and, and make these things. No. You have a responsibility to be responsible. Amen. So when it comes to living the word wholeheartedly, he's not going to make that happen in you. You do that. You choose to be responsible. You choose to live wholeheartedly. You choose to spend time in your word. You choose to go out and be a blessing to other people. You, you, it's on you. Are y'all hearing me on today? Yes. We as individuals, we need to understand that it is an option. You don't have to do it. But you ought to want to do it if you are a child of God who's been saved by his blood. Amen. So I notice there's an opportunity to live the word. There's an option to live the word. But then thirdly and lastly, and I'm done, there's an obligation mm -hmm. to live the word. Oh, trust and believe you have a, an option. But really, as a child of God, you really ought to feel obliged. Yeah. You ought to, there ought to be an obligation because of who he is yeah. and because of what he's done. Hallelujah. Preach, Pastor Sanders. Look in verse 73, it says, uh, your hands have made me and formed me and give me, and then he prays, give me understanding to learn your commands. Listen, we have an obligation, number one, because he made us. And we have an obligation, number two, because he molds us. Oh, I'm feeling this thing and I'm done. Listen, he made us. That's what the psalmist says. He says, your hands made me and formed me. We ought to feel obliged to speak up on his behalf and or to live the word, we ought to feel obliged to do so. Why? Because he made us with his own hands. I've told you this time and time again, in the uh, days of creation, in those uh, seven days of creation, six days of creation, uh, really, we read time and time again where God said, let there be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let there be light. Yeah. And there was light. Let there be this. Let there be that. Yeah. He spoke all those things into existence. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not what your Bible says? Yeah. Yeah. But he did something very interesting when it came to mankind. Yes, sir. Come on. Come on now. When he said, let there be, all you heard and all you read is, let there be. Yeah. But when it came to man, he says, let us yes, sir. create man. In our own image. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was as if God called upon his collective self, his collective being, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And he called upon his collective self and he said, let us do something different than what we did with the fish. Let us do something different than what we did with the cows yes. and the elephants and the monkeys and the hippopotamuses. And let us do something different than what we did with yes, the grass and with the, the stars and the yes, constellation. Let us do something different when it comes to man. Let us Yes, sir. Form and fashion man in our own image and in our likeness. And the Bible 
says he breaks down and he turns the dirt, the lowest element of, 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 of in creation, dirt, nothing but worthless dirt. He took something that was worthless and made it worthwhile and made it worthy. Worth. Hallelujah. He took that dirt, y'all. He literally got his hands dirty when he made you. He literally got his hands in the mud when he made you. And he took it and he formed it and he fashioned it in his own image. He said, I want you to look like me. And I want you to live like me. He says, and I'm going to go a, a step further and I'm going to breathe into your nostrils the breath of life. And the Bible says, he blew into the nostrils of mankind, Ruth, the Hebrew word which means breath. And he breathed into uh, breath and the spirit into mankind. And the Bible says, and man became a living being. Yes, he didn't do that with the cows. Yes. He didn't do that with the horses yes. and with the fish and with the birds. Yes. But he did it with you. Yes. He formed you and he fashioned you in his own image and likeness. That's how much he loves you. Hallelujah. He says, I want you to look like me. And I want you to live for me and live like me. He formed us. So the psalmist says, he says, watch this. He says, there's an obligation to speak up on his behalf. And there's an obligation to live according to the word of God. Why? He says, because your hands formed. I don't know about him, my brothers and my sisters, but I'm encouraged to know that we are wonderfully and fearfully made yes. by the hands of God. Oh, yeah. yes. You and you and you yes. made by God's hands. Uh -huh. So we ought to feel obligated to say something. I can't hold my peace. Y'all remember that incident when Jesus was with his boys? And his boys and, and, and uh, were there, and they were teaching and preaching and doing their thing. And all the people were screaming, hallelujah, praise God, and all this type of carrying on. And those religious folk, you know those religious folk, you got to watch religious folk. Hey. You got to watch. You know, I tell folk all the time, I, don't, I ain't too much big on church folk. I don't like church folk too much. I love them, but I don't like church folk. Right. I love Christians. Hello. But church folk, they can be religious. Yes. They can be, you know, just downright hateful and mean and stank and everything else. And so there's a whole lot of church folk. And they said, hey, Jesus, tell them folk to be quiet. They're making too much noise. Tell them to shut up. They don't need to be screaming and hollering, jumping and running and carrying on. Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus says, if these shall hold their peace, then the rocks will have no choice but to cry out and give me praise. And I don't know about you, child of God. God's been too good to me to let a rock steal my testimony. God picked me up and turned me around and he placed my feet on solid ground. So I can't give the, the, my, my praise to the rocks. They can't speak on my behalf. When I was too mean to live and wasn't fit to die, God saved me and God touched me and God turned my life around. I gotta say something. You can't keep me quiet. So we ought to have an obligation to say something. To speak up on his behalf. Not only did he made us, has he made us, but he's molded us. He, he's formed and fashioned us. So that we can be God representatives on this earth. Let the Lord use you. Yeah. Wherever you go, whatever you do, let him use you. Whether you're at your job, whether it's a secular job or not, let the Lord use you. Yeah. Whether you're at school or you're a student, let the Lord use you. Yeah. Husbands, let the Lord use you. Wives, let the Lord use you. Parents, let the Lord use you. Whoever you are, whatever you do in life, let the Lord use you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let that light shine so bright inside of you that folks see something different inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. Mold us. I'm done. Watch this. He says in verse 75, he says, I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Listen, we ought to feel obliged to say something in the good and in the bad times. <laughs> Deliver me from a Christian who only praises him when things are going well in their lives. 
Yeah, as long as you got a, a pocket full of money, then you can praise him. As long as you got resources, you can praise him. But show me a Christian who can praise him when their money is funny and their change is strange and their credit just don't get it. That's who I want to be around. I want to roll with folk that don't mind praising him even when they got bad news. I want to be around folk that don't mind praising him even when people turn their back on them and life seems to be upside down. Show me a person that can praise him when it's raining in their life. Show me a person that can praise him when it's storming in their life. Show me a person that can praise him even when their spouse walks out on the marriage and say, I don't want no parts of you anymore. Yeah, I praise him. Show me a person that can be afflicted like Job and lose their children, lose their good name, lose their standing in the community, lose their money, lose their job, and lose their health, but yet at the end of the day can say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Naked came I in this world, naked shall I return. Show me a person that can praise him and that chooses to lift him up even during the dark and dismal times in life. And I'll show you a true worshiper. He has made it. So it's in the good times and the bad times. So he says, even when I'm afflicted and even when I'm attacked and even when I'm assaulted and even when I'm ambushed, God is still worthy to be praised. Because God is still God, and God is still good. Yeah. Good day, church. Yeah. I got to leave you now. But I just want to tell somebody, yeah. let the Lord use you.